Welcome to Good Chris Selfian Talks. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. And I'm Brian. Thank you for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post a new episode at the start of each week with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to listen to. And now, let's talk more about this week's talk. Hello and welcome back to another talk. For this week, we're listening to an exhortation that was given at Verdugo Hills back in September by Brother Peter Wilson on the subject of scaffolding. Brother Peter looks at the idea of scaffolding and what it uses to support us. Uh, he talks about multiple parts of it uh, and how scaffolding, while sometimes seen as something that can obscure the actual building or something that you may not always think is being important, uh, is something instead that really helps to form the structure and in turn our scaffolding should be something that supports and helps us to develop into a people for God. Uh, I really enjoyed this exhortation when I heard Brother Peter give it. Uh, it was a great reminder and uh, as we start the new year I thought this would be a good exhortation to consider as it fo- helps us to focus and remind us on how we should be supporting ourselves and the structures we should put in our lives to make sure that we are growing up in the direction that we should go. Uh, as always, thank you for the suggestions and recommendations. Uh, somebody suggested this one to me after we had listened to it and thought it would be a great one to share. So uh, I hope that you enjoy this exhortation and that it is encouraging and uplifting to you in your walk and that you're having a great start to your new year. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to our brother Peter Wilson for his exhortation entitled Scaffolding. Every building begins in the dirt. And it takes some time and careful thought by the builder and architect working together to raise it safely and strongly, one section at a time. So it doesn't fall into a pile like that condo in Florida. And our spiritual lives are similar. They're small beginnings, ending in a beautiful temple structure that is our goal. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 and 22 says, We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom are all the building fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. So that temple is us, and that's what is being built. In whom ye are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3 supports this metaphor. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So God wants to build and dwell in us, and he will help us build. He has given us the solid rock foundation, the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone, Jesus. And we build our building structure by following the structure and using the strong steel of his truth. The first principles, that's the inner steel framework. And we strengthen our building team by fellowship of other workers, our ecclesia. So this familiar metaphor is a beautiful one and is pleasant to contemplate. So what more can be said about this? Contemplate it. Value the building, the tools that God has given us. Don't contaminate the work site. Is that enough of an exhortation? Well, there is an undervalued building tool worth considering, and I call it God's scaffold. Now, if I wanted to paint the ceiling here, I would need to raise platforms to stand on to do it well. 
and to do it safely. I would need a structure that supports something to lean on, to stand on. Most buildings um, raise modular scaffolding structures uh, when they're under construction. Um, and when looking at a building site, no one ever says, that's a beautiful scaffold system. They are by nature a support system. Nevertheless, we could not build without them. Now, it's also a term used in teaching. The teachers would recognize it. Uh, teachers provide virtual scaffolds for students to lean on, including outlines and thought leading questions and uh, advanced summaries, PowerPoint slides to give students a structure, something to pin key ideas on. Brother Christian did that with our um, Bible reading class. He had four questions, which were a scaffold, and that worked well. Parents provide scaffolding structure to their children's lives with family standards and rules and doing the readings together and Sunday school participation and talking about important things. The law of Moses was a scaffold. It was identified as a schoolmaster to bring Israel to Christ. The visual of Daniel's image is a scaffold to understand God's historical plan of salvation. Each section of history is attached to a different body part, and that's a, that's a virtual scaffold, a teaching tool. So, so far, do we understand what a scaffold is, both physically and metaphorically? So my exhortation and goal this morning is to give you a tool to build that man of faith or woman of faith, that man after God's own heart or woman after God's own heart with God's scaffolds uh, as we build our spiritual temple. So all my scaffolds are based on three Bible verses about God. All three promote a profound understanding and appreciation of who God is. And that's the ultimate scaffold platform to stand on. I use these to build faith, which makes me walk more confidently, which is joyful, which causes me to praise God, which is worship at its best. It's my goal to identify three examples of virtual building scaffolds and worship God. And I invite you to do that with me. As Psalm 34 and 3 says, oh, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So my scaffold has three platforms, three verses about God. And the first is Romans 8 and 28. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Notice the absolute extreme nature of this statement about God. The word all. Now, nothing in human experience is absolute. We worship God for this. And the phrase worshiping his holy name, blessing his holy name, which appears in various forms in the Bible, is this very process. All, every, never are terms used mostly in adolescence before we experience true life. Mom, can I go to this event? Everyone is going to it. Of course, mom never bought that because she knows knew that everyone wasn't. For this reason, salesmen are trained to challenge absolutes. When someone uses those terms, all, they go, all, every, never. 
So my question for you about this verse is, do you believe it? All things work together for good. If you think that this means that nothing bad will ever happen to you or your loved ones, then it would be impossible to believe. Because life experience teaches us differently. All things happen according to his purpose. That's what it says. God's purpose is not just to make us happy now. I often ponder why such valuable Christian Christadelphian leaders' lives were cut short. In my in ignorance, I categorize them as terribly bad occurrences. Um, in my youth, Dennis and Faye Ford, prolific preachers, Ron Abel, Chris Barrett, we could all make a longer list. Why were such valuable Christadelphian leaders' lives cut short? Why did David suffer so much at the hand of Saul? My answer is that perhaps he was forced out of the court of Saul so he would not become Saul, learn his ways, or take on his attitudes. I lost a job once where the salesmen were mostly extreme corruptors. They were very talented at it. And like David's situation, I think God took me out of there so I wouldn't learn their tricks. I'm more certain of that guess than I am of some of my other guesses about the other people. The key idea is that God has purpose in what happens to us. Teaching purposes, strengthening purposes, long-range salvation purposes, living object lesson for other purposes. So ask yourself, when trouble hits, am I focused only on me, the pain, the worry? What is God's purpose in this? How do I fit into it? And as Jason said last week in his exhortation, it's a comfort to know that God hurts when we hurt. He, he is with us in suffering. His instruction is a sign of love. But for me to tell you with absolute confidence what specific reason God is allowing your personal suffering would be obnoxious. Any attempt to minimize the impact of suffering by phrases such as at least or when God closes the door, he opens another, are hard to swallow. And imputing a cause and effect for others is just insensitive. So I walk carefully when tempted to speak for God. This is why this happened to you. You have cancer because you got hurt because you did this wrong. You lost your job because you have conflict because. I do get answers for myself sometimes to these kind of questions, but not until many years later, usually. It is possible, however, to flip the narrative of bad things. Jesus recommends we do this, that there are two sides to every coin. In the familiar, I never looked at it this way before, but the the Beatitudes are a flip. Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. Then he flips, for their, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they which are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. For great is your reward in heaven. You can reframe the present problem with a future frame. Visualize a different outcome. 
and it's supported by the promises of Jesus. Every situation has a secondary benefit. It's our job to find it. Of course, sometimes it doesn't seem to be equal. Uh, the benefits of COVID of, are not equal with the, the problems in sickness and death. But we, we can find a secondary benefit if we look to it. So why did I choose this verse for my scaffold? It reinforces to me the powerful hand of God in my life. I'm not just wandering around life, bumping into the furniture. God has a purpose for me. My faith is strengthened by contemplating this. I think, what a wonderful God. This is my God. It's personal. The contemplation of this verse gives me confidence and joy and trust. It's a true scaffold because I lean on it. I stand on this principle while I navigate the process of building myself into a man of God. It allows me to focus outside of myself and on my problems. No why me, no woes me. I am in God's hand. I avoid worry and anxiety and grow and build, looking straight forward. My goal is to elevate my estimation of God, to build my faith, to strengthen my walk. It gives me joy and peace. If I can do this, my building project will proceed. So my second scaffold platform is this. First Chronicles 16 and 34. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, this is a phrase that's in the Bible 88 times. We make whole important doctrines and rules based on things that are in the Bible once. This is in the Bible 88 times. And this is another absolute, extreme uh, attribute of God, signaled by the word forever. Now, human forgiveness is often fragile. Love can fade sometimes, inexplicably, but not God's. His mercy endureth forever. As James says, about God, there is no shadow of turning. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked for Scap Bold Platform number one. Do you believe it? If you do, you ought to act like you ought to walk joyfully, confidently. How do you know that it's true? Can you feel forgiveness? What does it feel like? I don't think forgiveness has a feeling. And you don't get a, a forgiveness certificate for every trans forgiven transgression. But I do think it's opposite. Guilt has a feeling. We've all felt that freezing kind of worry and debilitating depression Sometimes even physical illness. Perhaps the peace that comes from the absence of guilt is the only indication now of forgiveness. Perhaps it's the act of forgiving others that teaches us how it feels. If you've forgiven others like God does you, you may know what I'm referring to. But ultimately, to believe this, we have to have faith. God said it, we believe it. Romans 8 and 1, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. God's mercy, his forgiveness, we are forgiven by our intention and 
uh, attempts to walk after the spirit. <laughs> so we have some extreme um, descriptions of God's forgiveness in Psalm 103. Verse 11, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. God's judgments for us are not legalistic. We have a mandatory sentence here. No, that's not God. Verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far is his mercy on us. How far is that? Well, you keep going around a circle, you'll never find it. It's like the love of Father has for his children. How do you measure that? If you have children, you know it's immeasurable. Verse 17, for the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Another immeasurable qualifier, quantifier. It's beneficial to recognize the quality of God's mercy, resulting in thankfulness, joy, confidence, strength, and temptation. We claim it by our intention to turn from sin and follow through in attempting to be true to this intention. So I have a guilt story. My dad, when he was a young man, um, was a conscientious objector, and he's, he went and did alternate service on a, a farm camp with other Christadelphian young men and German prisoners. And um, when they were working in the field, they had a guard with a machine gun standing over him. And the farmer used to stop his truck on the way back from the fields when the day was over in a specific spot so that the locals could throw rocks at these guilty cowards in the back of his truck. Now this is something that can happen to all of us while we're on our scaffold platform of the everlasting mercy of God. While we're working on our temple building others, uh, even Christadelphians will throw rocks at us guilty sinners. You know that's true. You wish it wasn't. Let them, but keep building. You are on the scaffold of mercy. Keep building, not arguing or defending yourself because you know that God is the God of all mercy. And that's what you stand on. That's the platform you stand on, that confidence. And scaffolds lift you up above the guilt. They support you through any momentary shame and promise forgiveness if you repent. It's solid and you can stand on it. Matthew 11, Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor, and I say building your spiritual house, and are heavy laden, and I say with guilt, and I will give you rest. There is not one of us here today that doesn't have something they have done that they regret, feel guilt about. Put that burden down now. Stop carrying it. Repent and climb up on this mercy scaffold and keep building. Ignore others who won't forgive you and throw accusations at you in God's, it is God's forgiveness that counts. Keep building. Now, why did I choose this verse as a scaffold? I chose it because I am a sinner. I have things I regret. They bother me. But only by believing in God's mercy can I move forward in building myself into a man of God. Otherwise, my faith would suffer. I might not feel worthy to even come to meeting. 
I think of God's character represented in the father of the parable, in the parable of the prodigal son, which we read in our readings this week. He was eager for his son to return to the family, watching for him a long way off. And he sees him coming home and runs to him. He wasn't interested in hearing the guilty confession. He didn't even let him complete it. And when I read this, I say, that's my God. By me standing on this elevated scaffold platform, God is made special to me. I know that his mercy for me endures forever. It's one of the reasons I worship him. It increases my faith, my joy, my confidence, my spiritual energy. And I want to serve a God like this. My last scaffold platform verse is this. Psalm 103 and 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. Now, this seems like kind of an ordinary verse, especially in the context of Psalm 103, which has a lot of those thunder and lightning crashing verses that hit you heavily. But I would suggest that this is a still small voice verse that is so powerful, we miss it. The key idea is that God has a complete plan and does what he says he will do. It is absolutely sure. He is omnipotent. And we wait for him. This is a confidence boost, and it follows a contrasting section in Psalm 103 where everything human is temporary. It says things like, man is as the grass that withereth, the wind that passeth over it and is gone. So we can't judge God by human standards. God is God and not a man. Now, we could choose to focus on the fragility of life. We could say, well, let's make the most of it. We're not here for very long. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Or we could stand on that platform of confidence in God's word, our hope, knowing that God's kingdom is coming, and we need to make ourselves into that man of God that can dwell with him in eternity. So picture yourself on the scaffold, the righteous surety of God. The wind may be shaking your scaffold. It may be vibrating. But the righteous surety of God uh, is solid and sure. Earthquakes happen. Sickness happens. Discord happens. But God's kingdom is sure. He has already created it in heaven. And we wait for his right moment for his new Jerusalem to come down from heaven. And hope brings strength as we build. God talks about his plan as if it's already happened. Isaiah 46, he's God is one who can declare the end from the beginning and from ancient time, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now, no human could claim that God is elevated, uh, could claim this. God is elevated in my mind. So do you believe it? Do you believe that? His kingdom is coming and that it's sure. How do I know it's true? It takes faith. And God can help you with your unbelief if you if that's your problem. We build in faith. The Bible says it's true. 
And the Bible to me is an absolutely inspired work. The prophecies about Israel, how it all holds together, its central theme carried throughout by many authors and thousands of years stoke the fires of my belief. Nature tells me that God exists. Life experience has taught me that God's hand is at work in my life in ways too divine to be coincidental. So I believe it's true, but I need to remind myself often and pray for it. Thy kingdom come. Our sure hope is our scaffold platform. I have an apology for you. There is a part of the Jewish calendar with three important feasts. That is the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, 10 days later, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and 15 later, days later, the Feast of Tabernacles. We, this season of feast just happened. And I think it's possible that Jesus will return on the Feast of Trumpets. It's supported by several verses. Uh, Matthew 7 and Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians 15. So the Feast of um, Trumpets is also called the, the Feast of New Beginnings, a new year, a new moon. And I thought maybe this was the year. This was the month in September. And that was the day. And yet, I said nothing. Nothing to you, my brethren. Nothing to my friends. I just sat and waited in expectation. I even started listening to Handel's Messiah. The famous aria was, The trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise incorruptible. And my spirit was elevated but I said nothing. So for this, I'm sorry. I turned out to be wrong about the time, but I owed my brethren and sisters better. So what is the power of this scaffold? The power of this scaffold is expectation. And we need to create that expectation in our loved ones and our friends and our acquaintances and our workers. Telling someone who will listen, there's strength in a bit. Being fully committed, not with one foot on the scaffold and another waving in the breeze. David said in Psalm 71, I will go in the strength of the Lord. I will make mention of thy righteousness. That phrase, thy righteousness, is the is salvation plan. So why did I pick this verse as a scaffold? I picked it because it elevates God. I encourage you to think of God's attributes and to bless his holy name. There is nothing sure in humanity, nothing like God in his plan of salvation. God will do what he said he would. I believe it's sure. And we worship him for this. And we build on this our scaffold when the wind shakes it. And we have joy and confidence over it. We keep initiate, uh, we keep building ourselves as men and women of faith in response to it. So now as we end our exhortation and we turn our attention to these emblems, where is Jesus in this idea of scaffolding? Well, we know that he, we are told that we are to build on the rock, which is Christ, and that he is the cornerstone. But I believe that Jesus is with us on each of these scaffolds. The first one, Christ is with us on the scaffold of all good things. When we contemplate 
all things work for good, we sometimes think of things that you could label as bad that turn out to be good. What fits this more than the the death and resurrection of Christ? The cruel death and resurrection became life for humanity. So he is with us on that scaffold. The mercy of God, our second scaffold platform, is no more strongly exercised than in the forgiveness provided by Jesus' victory over sin. In God's sure plan of salvation, our hope, Jesus was part of it from the very beginning, all through God's plan of salvation. And it's through him that God will realize it from the very beginning. So as we share these emblems, visualize yourself on the three scaffold platforms with Jesus by your side. Worship God for who he is and what he has done. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. We hope this talk helped you in your walk. If you would like to hear more, please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review in Apple Podcast or whichever service you are using to help more people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this particular talk, please share it with someone who you think might enjoy it as well. For show notes on the talk you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash GCT or check the show notes section of your podcast player. Please share your thoughts on the talk from this week on our Facebook or Instagram pages, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks, on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel where these talks are posted as well. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to our email at goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media accounts. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.